Welcome to Working Title, the podcast where we still haven't decided on a name and we take a deep dive into a recent publication from the EL Magazine. We unpack its connections to teaching and learning in Kent County. I'm Kelly Brockway and I'm here with my co-host Keith Tramper and today we have a special guest, Diane Teich. She is the early literacy coach here at Kent ISD and she has been leading our Ignite Engagement project for the last three years and that project is specifically focused on student engagement. So the title of today's show is Engage and Motivate and we have invited our resident expert, Diane, to join us. Thank you, Kelly. It's a pleasure to be here. So to get us warmed up and get us started today, we're going to start with an intro question. Uh, What's the biggest thing on your plate right now? I think the biggest thing on my plate right now is rethinking the way that I deliver any kind of professional learning. Um, Know that teachers right now and educators in general are completely overwhelmed with everything going on, um, as we talked about in our last episode, and trying to find that sweet spot of how we still help them grow professionally Um, in a way that's manageable and accessible to them uh, has been kind of on the forefront of my mind. So we've been exploring some things like micro learning and and podcasting um, to see how we can reach people and and continue to help teachers grow during this time. Diane, what about you? I think the biggest thing on my plate right now is really focused on examining my own practice and the work that I do with teachers and coaches and making sure that I am infusing um, equity and and uh, racial justice into everything I do um, really kind of had an awakening in the last couple of years that have made that a priority for me. And so, you know, in looking at engagement in particular, the topic of today's episode, I think that if we're not considering all students and all teachers and all perspectives and bringing that into the work we do, we're not going to reach full engagement. Yeah. And based on both of those, I think you have platters and not plates. <laughs> That's what it feels like. I don't know about anybody else, but it feels like I have a platter um, versus a plate right now. And I think the biggest thing on that is just um, one of the biggest things I've just been dealing with lately is just meeting people's needs and really trying to connect individually, both professionally and in my personal life, you know, with my kiddos and my family, um, just what what's going on like how can you meet each individual where they're at how do we structure professional learning so it meets the needs um of our educators in our county you know how do we um like you kind of mentioned keith about acknowledging a certain level of you know kind of that crisis efficacy that we talked about last time you know we're in this uh pandemic and you know it's been ongoing and people are dealing with an entire range of, of things. And so just being, trying to be aware of what everyone's got going, really trying to individually connect and um, meet people where they're at. Yeah, for sure. Which is hard when you're trying to serve everyone. (laughs) (laughs) All right. The article that we're focusing on today is the future of learning lies in engagement by Andy Hargreaves. And it, It essentially focuses on that right now in education, we're sort of sitting in this place where we're totally disrupted. And the author says that there's kind of three ways forward that we're all sort of pushing for. The first path is kind of aiming to fill the gaps of what has been lost during the pandemic so far, Um, looking at academically where our students are and where they should have been and seeing how we can fill those gaps. The second path is kind of aiming at students' mental health recognizing that there are a lot of stressors, a lot of things going on in our students' lives and our teachers' lives, um, and focusing on providing supports to to meet their mental health needs. And the last path is um, focused on using technology, leveraging technology to increase the variety of offerings that we have, the the ways we deliver education to our students um, through the use of technology. So really, three different paths that right now a lot of our schools are kind of moving forward in. And the author, Andy Hargreaves, kind of focuses on three different approaches that all focus on engagement, arguing that engagement is the one true path forward out of the disruption that we're in right now. Well, and I think what stood out to me too, uh, when we decided on our, you know, this article being our focus article was, um, we've got lots 
of recommended pathways flying at us just in the last six to eight months. We've had, you know, our Department of Education has put forth um, their blueprint for recovery, numbers of organizations and associations, lots of uh, research-based articles on their recommended paths forward. And I think that's what jumped out at me about this um, article was he's he really, you know, you, you mentioned those three really common paths, social emotional learning, uh, ed tech, uh, focusing on, you know, the academic learning loss per se, and that those tend to be three very common focus areas right now. And he's really suggesting a, a shift away from those and that really we should be focused on engagement. Well, and, and I would argue that while he is advocating for a shift away from those three, it's when we talk about engagement, engagement incorporates mental health and well-being. Engagement incorporates the use of technology and, and digital learning that we've become much more adept at. And engagement addresses learning loss in a much more, um, rather than focusing on deficits, it addresses learning, learning from an asset-based viewpoint. So, you know, um, he does say on, in, in the article, we shouldn't ignore what children have missed academically, but we shouldn't use a deficit-focused te testing approach to drive our response. So I think that that right there in a nutshell says, you know, what's wrong with the deficit focus with the learning loss focus is we're too, we're paying too much attention to what students have lost. But I would like to argue, what if they lost in relation to what, you know, to the standards that say by the end of this grade, they have to know this. Well, what happens if all the students, because they've all been through this pandemic, don't know this at the end of this grade? Is it really learning loss or is it just you know, we need to push it back a little bit. And so, and then the other piece of that is just not focusing on the learning that kids did do during the pandemic. And kids have had some very powerful learning in a real world setting that we've been ignoring. And I think if we bring that into our recovery efforts, we will have much higher engagement and we will really recognize there's not the loss we think there is. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, asset-based thinking is another way to think about this too, that not all students struggle, right? There are some students that are thriving in the environment that they're in right now. And it's important not to leave that behind. So like our students who are maybe, I think the author refers to students who are ADHD and need to be up and moving around, but in a classroom that's not as feasible um, because it's distracting to other students or, you know, um, that, whereas in a virtual setting, um, not as disruptive, so um, they can focus better. Uh, may, there's other students that maybe got a chance to connect more deeply with their parents and their the people in their home and learn some of their culture and heritage in a deeper way than they would have um, if they were going full-time face-to-face in school. And um, <laughs> the, the last one they put in there too was, kids were kind of shielded from the the monotony of test preparation as well through all of this too, um, because it was less emphasized in the last couple of years. Yeah. And our LLCN group, who also runs a podcast, did a episode uh, back in May with Ron uh, Berger, Berger, I'm not sure if I'm saying his last name right, but um, titled Our Kids Are Not Broken, where they specifically look at the prevalent use of the term learning loss and the deficit mindset that kind of goes along with that and how detrimental that can be. Um, so we'll link that in our show notes so that um, you can if you want to dig into this idea of learning loss a little bit more, you can um, I really encourage you to listen to that. Yeah. And I want to say too, that if we're spending our time doing test prep and then testing kids, we're not spending our time doing the important work of building relationships and building community in our classrooms. And kids are coming off of a stressful anxiety producing time and testing is just bringing on more of that. And the test results don't really help us know exactly what each kid needs because it is so deficit focused. So I think that we need to really rethink how we're spending this time and move away from this emphasis on testing and test prep and allow time for relationship building and connections. Just 
you know, there was a documentary, uh, most likely to succeed. And, um, they really got into this exploration of innovative approaches to education. So this is way pre pandemic. Um, but one thing, one reference to a study from that documentary that has stuck with me, um, was they referenced a study where they examined a physics class. And I can't remember if they said this was an advanced physics class. It must have been because the class average on the final exam was a B. Um, so that, I mean, from, from a, Physics, these had to be, you know, for the class average to be a B, that's that's pretty pretty powerful uh, average for physics. Um, but what they did was they had those students take the exact same final exam three months later. And the class average was an F. There was no retention or very little. I shouldn't say no. There was very little retention there. It's truly test prep. Those kids prepped for that test. They had a collective B average. And then they... We're off for the summer and there's three months. And, you know, it's, that st- has stuck with me ever since I heard it to the point where are we teaching for recall, for test prep? Um, and then they talked about how, you know, if you ask any student, you know, and that has graduated from school, recall your most memorable experiences. What are things, what is some learning that has stuck with you? And they typically... The majority will recall learning experiences that engaged them, that were connected to their interests, connected to their communities, or there were real world problems that they were that they were engaged in to solve. So, um, or it could be because of the relationship with the teacher. A lot of times, if it's something about a very rote memorization type of a skill that they remembered, they will follow that up with some sort of relational connection to the teacher. And that that really is the whole argument for why engagement should be our path forward, right? There are so many studies about retention. And, you know, I, the teachers that I work with will say to me, I know they were supposed to teach this in second grade, and I'm a third grade teacher, and the kids don't seem to know it. Well, it's not that the teacher didn't teach it. It's that we're not teaching in ways that are engaging for kids so that they retain and reapply what they learn. They learn it in the moment and then we move on and so do they and it's forgotten. And so when we focus more on engagement and teaching in ways that kids are truly engaged in their learning, the retention and reapplication goes way up. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that stuck with me from this article, um, one way that they suggested building engagement, and Diane, I'm sure you have a a thousand different ways to look at this too. one of the ways that the author suggested was infusing learning with meaning and purpose, right? And that is, I, I, to me, it, it speaks to the whole um, efficacy behind project-based learning, problem-based learning, place-based learning. When you start to engage students in the real world around them into their communities and learning is a part of that, right? The ability to affect your community is not a result of the learning. It's part of the learning. It's part of what you're doing along the way. And I think some schools do that really well when they engage students in project-based and problem-based and place-based learning. But like the author had a quote here that said, our, stu- our schools can't educate students well if we ignore the world around them. So we really should be asking um, our educators to leverage the worlds around our students Um, to engage them and bring them in because it's impossible not to engage them when they're engaged in their communities and know that there's an audience out there that's beyond their classroom. Well, and we talked about that a little bit in our last episode too. Uh, Keith, if you remember from the last publication of EL Magazine, they specifically had an article that talked about embracing your place, you know, where you are currently at and how do you really truly embrace whether your physical place, your community, they talked about uh, community as your classroom and doing um, asset mapping in your community. Um, but then they, you know, they, they are also talking about from a technology base, you know, if, if your school has chosen a certain learning management system, you embrace your place, learn about that system, learn what apps connect with that system so that you can truly use it to its full potential. I think we can do the same thing in our communities. Um, And in that last episode, we talked about, you know, this idea of asset mapping our community. Great. But if individual teachers are expected to do that one by one by one, the reality of that is there's just not enough time in the day, you know, for for that. So how can we 
collaborate as a community so that our teachers aren't left to have to go out and truly initiate all of that on their own. You know, how can we provide them with, here is an asset map of our community that we've put together thus far. Where might you see us, you know, collaborating with your classroom or your learners and things like that. So. And I think that's something too, like as we moved into virtual learning, we, we were inviting parents <laughs> who are also generally professionals in their, their worlds too, and in their communities to see what was happening inside of the classroom a bit. And I think it's also on the community, like you said, to come in and say, Hey, like I saw that you were teaching, um, a little bit about variables and you know what we do a lot of that in our in my line of work is there a way i could come in and just kind of talk to you about or talk to your kids about how this connects and what they could expect about this particular thing in the real world um that's huge well and when you think about engagement too thinking about um this idea of engagement beyond just you know, even student engagement, that we're, we're looking at community engagement and parent engagement as truly engagement, collaboration, not strictly participation, which it has typically been in the past, you know, that there's a parent night, and we hope you participate and come and eat the cookies and listen to our information. But um, how do we how do we create uh, an engaged partnership, a collaborative partnership um, with our community, with our families, um, so that our students can be as equally engaged as they possibly can. And that Kelly also speaks to what I mentioned earlier about equity and, um, you know, justice in our classrooms that when we bring families in and we take advantage of the assets that they can bring us, it, it then helps all students to feel represented and included. And it also teaches others about people who may be unlike them. Um, and I also want to say in terms of the, the real world purpose and, you know, things like project-based learning and things like that, I know there are teachers when they think about something like project-based learning and place-based learning, it feels overwhelming to them, but there are ways to make learning authentic and purposeful without necessarily diving into something like a big project. It can't be as simple as just having the courage to bring real real world issues into the classroom and real world issues are often controversial, but they are the ones that truly engage kids. When we avoid talking about things that are happening in the world around them, we're not, we're not protecting them from it. They know it's happening. They hear about it. They see it. They're on the internet. Parents are talking about it at home. They think their kids aren't listening. They, they know. And so when we bring those into the classroom, even at the youngest ages and give kids opportunities to think about and talk about and process that, their engagement goes up. And we really are teaching them so many of the skills that right now we are teaching through rote exercises and worksheets. And so it's, um, it's another way to look at it, you know, in addition to things like project-based learning and place-based learning. Well, and I think you you bring up a really good point, Diane, in that I think a way that our administrators can be a part of this work is to provide the space and the freedom for teachers to make those innovative, engaged changes in their classroom. They need that support to talk about. They need to know that they're supported and they need to have those structures and guidance relative to bringing those controversial topics into their classrooms, you know, instead of it's one thing to do it on your own, but it's another thing when I've had conversations with my administrator or my teaching colleagues, I have a set of guidelines that my district has given me to help provide me support when I'm engaging in this type of work um, and bringing these. And I have the freedom to do it. I have the encouragement and the freedom to explore things like place-based learning, project-based learning. I have I have the, the, that level of freedom um, away from that really structured, scripted, you know, potential curriculum that our district might have. And so I think that that's a place um, from a leadership lens that could really uh, make a difference. And, and he talks about that. The, art, um, the author does on page 30 when he says, you know, schools need more of the freedom to innovate. He, so he specifically identifies that this is going to be a key component. Um, if, you, if you're going to pursue this pathway, you're going to need to look at what structures for freedom and support do you have in place. 
That's right, Kelly. And the the whole move that we have made over time toward the scripted, you know, published programs and, you know, districts are investing tons of money into these programs. And some of them have wonderful resources. But when we say you have to follow the script and you have to follow the pacing guide, we really tie teachers' hands to do anything innovative or engaging for kids. And the vast majority of these programs are not engaging in really any way. (laughs) Well, especially on a day-to-day basis. uh, Right. You know, it, it gets a little mundane after a little while. Right. And so one of the things that we have found to be very powerful in the Ignite Engagement program that I facilitate is the teachers, when they sign up, do get permission from their administrators to step outside the box. So even if it's a district that's adopted a brand new scripted curriculum, the teacher has the permission to use that curriculum as a resource, but not necessarily follow the day-to-day script. And this has really empowered the teachers to do some wonderfully innovative things in their classrooms that is definitely increasing engagement and as a result, increasing students' you know, retention and reapplication of what they're learning and their achievement levels. They're excited about what they're learning. They are extending their learning beyond school hours. You know, they, they're getting so into it. And it's also allowed teachers that freedom to tie in those real world issues that I mentioned earlier that students are desperate to learn about in a safe environment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To summarize that, I think you're saying like, the more we can move away from standardization of things, like here is the curriculum that you have to teach. Ask any teacher that totally kills any creativity in your classroom. But when you as a, as a leader in education can step back and say, okay, this is a resource for you to teach with. This is the things that you're going to use. Now be creative with it. We don't want you to teach everything to a T we need you to, be creative and embrace yourself in this and and do what's best for your students um, based on your day-to-day interactions with them. So limit that standardization, but, uh, you know, encourage teachers to innovate and be creative. So I have an example of a teacher who um, their district this year adopted a brand new literacy curriculum at the elementary level. So she is not terribly familiar with this curriculum and as a result feels like she really has to go through it for a year to get to know it. And, And I agree with that. It's really difficult to know what resources you have without ever having gone through the, the steps of the curriculum. But She also knows that the curriculum, the way it's designed, is not engaging her students. And so at the start of each unit, she is looking at what is this unit teaching and then developing an essential question that is real world connected that throughout the unit, the kids and she come back to to really help the kids see why what they're learning is relevant and why it matters. So it's a, it's a way, even with a brand new curriculum that you feel like you have to go through the script and you have to follow it because you don't even know what's there, there are still ways to come back and tie it into some meaningful and purposeful learning for kids. And this really reminds me about uh, Marzano's Art and Science of Teaching. You know, anytime I do work with districts around curriculum alignment, uh, any type of curricular work, you know, that question comes up about, you know, this is our our guaranteed viable curriculum. Well, what does that mean? You know, one of the things that I think the science part of curriculum and in, in teaching and learning is that we all as a grade level team or as a district, we all agree what what learning our students are going to, you know, what what we're going to prioritize, what we're committed to every student learning. The artful side of teaching is the how, how we do that. Now, those really scripted curriculums can be a lifesaver in certain situations. I can remember my times as a first year teacher. Um, There was a couple of courses that I taught that had wonderful resources that I could rely on heavily. I was a newbie. I'm I'm working my way through this and feeling learning classroom management and all of those things. Um, And then I had a couple of courses assigned to me that there was no curricular resources and what the panic that was to not have you know, anything there for me to use. And I I was left to do all of that on my own. Um, So I think that those resources can be hugely beneficial, but also 
I think we'll see our biggest impact with those resources if our teachers have the flexibility like Diane just used in her example, where our teachers can take the learning that's been prioritized. And if need, we can meet our students where they're at, you know, really um, dig in on what they're interested in and use that and use the passions of the teacher. I think sometimes we forget about how exciting it can be to learn from someone who's really passionate about some something and I, I i just from an example i go back my daughter had a teacher in first grade who was passionate about penguins this teacher loved penguins and i know it sounds funny but my daughter knows every type of penguin she can still <laughs> recall she's in eighth grade now she can still recall all the characteristics of all the you know the main types of penguins and it was because of that teacher um that teacher got her interested in biology because she could see, she could feel the passion of that teacher. And the last thing we want to do is squelch that. Yeah. And Kelly, that also speaks to what are kids passionate about and giving kids freedom and choice to, to learn about things that they are really interested in. And, you know, I, I'm often challenged with, well, what about the standards? If we let kids choose what they want to learn about, what about the standards? Well, it's not necessarily a free, totally wide open choice. You know, if we have to teach about, um, you know, animals, then, you know, kids can choose the animal they want to study. They can choose if they want to study the animal's habitat or the animal's adaptations or, um, you know, lots of lots of different um, approaches. They could choose to study endangered animals and what are we doing about them? Um, but student choice is a huge piece in engagement. And when students can choose to learn about things they are passionate about, it is astounding how many standards are taught in the process of teaching them how to learn about what they're passionate about. So uh, we call that back mapping. We can't always anticipate everything that kids will learn when we set them off on an adventure of inquiry. But after the fact, when we stop and go back and look at what those students have learned, how they learned it, and what they produced as a result of their learning, it's amazing how many standards we can say, wow, they've mastered that standard probably better than they would have if I had marched them through my scripted curriculum for this unit. So um, that freedom piece is, is speaks to both teachers and students. Well, and I think when you talk about, when we talk about like a teacher's passion or a student's passion or, or interest level, uh, we might be quick to infer that we mean everything has to be fun. And I think the article uh, the author does a really good job in this article about creating that delineation that it's really beyond fun. It's more about mastery. It's more about harnessing those interests and that in getting to that engagement piece to to move a student to mastery. Um, it's not just about what's the most fun thing you want to do today, you know. And so, I think I think that the, that's a um, a common misconception about student engagement. And and he he quotes that. You know, one, he says, one misconception about student engagement is that it's all about making learning fun um, and that hard earned accomplishment provides more lasting fulfillment and engagement than fleeting moments of fun. And I will say as a, as an early teacher, I was definitely in that, in that school of thought of in order for it to be engaging, it has to be fun. And I brought games into the classroom and, you know, we played Jeopardy and all these different things. It really did not make a difference in terms of what students retained and were able to use later. Um, what does make a difference is, is challenge, you know, kids having the appropriate level of challenge and really teaching kids, explicitly teaching kids how to manage struggle because you know, any when we think back on our lives and the things that we feel most proud of and our most memorable experiences, probably nearly all of them were something that involved some challenge and some struggle. And that feeling of accomplishment when you've overcome that struggle, it, it is really rewarding and it really sticks with you. And so we need to be spending time teaching kids what it means to struggle, how to manage struggle, and that feeling when you overcome it. I think we have so many kids who, who avoid struggle because it feels scary to them because we haven't taught them the benefits of struggle. And just to add on to that, the the concept of, that sticks out to me when I hear about this is is craftsmanship, right? Like when you can get when you get a student who's like honed in on, oh my gosh, I'm interested in this, and I can see how this fits into something that I'm passionate about. They will go and dig into it and dig into it, and they will produce one of the best like 
they will far exceed your expectations. Right. And that's something that they will remember. Like, wow, I, I really put my heart and soul into this. I remember a lot of this. This is, this is stuff that stuck with me and I'm really proud of what I was able to accomplish. Like I know, um, when I first came into the ed tech world, um, just after leaving the classroom, uh, genius hour and 20 time were big things. Right. Um, and, I think this is sort of what that was getting at is giving students that space to dig way into a topic that's, that's that they have a passion for or an interest in. And then to use your term back mapping it to say, okay, where are the standards that we met along the way? Well, and this conversation is really reminding me, Diane, of your first year of your cohort. And I remember you showing me a picture of a student who was reading a book. And the significance of this photo was that this was during recess time of a student who lived for recess. Like, pro I, I, I don't know the student, so, but I would imagine if you asked him his favorite part of, you know, of school, it would have been recess. But here is the student sitting reading this book. It was a book, I believe, about the Holocaust um, or World War II, something similar. I Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not sure the topic, but. The idea was that the teacher had presented this information in such an engaging way that the student was hooked and therefore had asked to stay in from recess to continue to learn more. You just yeah. can't get enough. You know, I, and Diane can probably talk a little bit more about uh, the work that she's doing uh, with the project, uh, Ignite Engagement Project. They are in their third year and they're just doing phenomenal things. Yeah. So, um that is, you were correct, Kelly. It was a, an elementary, upper elementary student who had been introduced to the Holocaust through some work the teacher had done and just said, do you have any other resources about this and stayed in at recess to, to start to go through those resources and then took them home and continued to work with them at home. Um, and we are seeing a lot of that in the classrooms that I am working in um, because the teachers are really working to implement the conditions in their classroom that lend themselves to students choosing to engage. I think there's a big misconception that it's the teacher's job to engage the students. And so, you know, we use metaphors like, well, I'm doing cartwheels and hanging upside down from the ceiling and, and dancing the jig every day to engage my students. But the reality is there is nothing we can do that will force a student to engage. Students have to choose to engage. And in order for them to choose to engage, we have to create the conditions that make that likely. And so that's really what Ignite Engagement is all about, is helping teachers to learn um, what those conditions are and help them strategize ways to implement those conditions in their classrooms. So we've talked about some of those conditions already, you know, bringing real world issues into the classroom and giving teachers the freedom to, you know, go beyond the script in their curriculum. Um, but there are lots of other conditions that really lend themselves to students choosing to engage. Another piece of it is that we teach students explicitly what engagement is, what it looks like, what it feels like. Um, we are using Ellen Keene's book, Engaging Children, as kind of the foundation of or the starting point of our work together. And in that book, she um, identifies four pillars of engagement. And so when we look at those conditions of the classroom, we're really looking at how do we create conditions that lend themselves to those four pillars. And those four pillars are intellectual urgency, which is what Kelly mentioned, that feeling of I have to know more. I, I just have to keep learning about this topic. Um, emotional resonance. Research shows that almost everything that we remember in what we learn, we remember because it has some emotional tie to us. We have some emotional reaction to it. And it doesn't have to be a hard emotion. It can be joy. But when we feel an emotion, we tend to be more engaged and remember more about what it is we're learning. Um, perspective bending is another pillar. And that really speaks to that community building and establishing an environment of trust where kids can openly and freely discuss and disagree with each other in productive and respectful ways and learn from each other. So perspective bending is not necessarily about changing people's minds, but it's about helping them understand others' perspectives and maybe bending their own a little bit here and there. And then the last one is called the aesthetic world. And it's really about 
what is beautiful to you? What is meaningful to you personally? Um, it overlaps with the other pillars, but it's, it's really about, you know, there's just something about that. Um, so, you know, um, that, that speaks to you in a way that it's just compelling. And so when you can explore whatever that is, you know, more deeply, you're going to be more engaged and you're going to learn more and remember more. So that's kind of the foundation of our work. And none of it has to do with fun. It's, you know, and the, and the students and the teachers in the classrooms that are in our cohorts are having fun. They're having fun because they're excited about what they're learning about. They're engaged in what they're learning about. They can't wait to share their learning with their classmates and others. We talk a lot about taking the audience outside the classroom and really giving them, you know, real world authentic audiences for the learning. And the project is, um, has so many unique components to it, uh, the Ignite Engagement Project does. And when Diane uh, first presented, um, when we started talking about this idea, the thing that stood out to me the most was this idea of empowering students to learn about their own engagement, providing them a toolkit to acknowledge when they're disengaged, giving them the resources, they you know, um, tools and tips and tricks to re-engage, you know, just, just learning about their own learning. Um, and, and really that, that whole empowering of, of students is, is a powerful, unique piece to this uh, professional learning opportunity. Um, each podcast, each of us uh, picks another article that we would recommend that you read from the issue. But I'm going to step outside uh, the boundaries on this one because um, Diane, our special guest Diane, and uh, the researcher of the book that she referenced um, actually co-authored an article for this publication. So while it didn't get selected to be published, um, I do have that article and it's called Ignite Engagement, Professional Learning to Increase Student Engagement. It's uh, authored by Diane and Ellen, uh, Ellen Oliver Keen. Um, and it really goes into a lot of the details of the project. So if you want to know more about our professional learning work around Ignite Engagement and the amazing um, things that are happening, more details about those pillars, I would really encourage you to read that article. Um, I, I think the biggest takeaway for me uh, has been to um, that we know right now, we've talked about it even in this episode and past episodes, that uh, teacher burnout is really high at this time. Our teachers are struggling. Um, and when you read this article or we get the data back, those that teacher testimonial piece of our um, reflection through this Ignite Engagement uh, journey, you'll consistently hear things from these teachers that it has renewed my joy of teaching, for example. They talk explicitly, they reflect explicitly on their own reignitement of their passion around teaching, uh, which has gone out, you know, that that flame has gone out for a lot of our teachers or is, or is diminishing drastically. So while the focus of our Ignite Engagement project is about student engagement, um, you know, its focus is student engagement, a result is teacher re-engagement in the profession. We're, we're seeing it over and over. Uh, and I think it's, it's, what we need now more than anything. Uh, so I would really encourage you to read that article. How about you guys? What other articles would you recommend from this issue? The article that um, I really connected with was around six intrinsic motivators to power up your teaching by Mike Anderson. The things that they talked about, uh, Mike talked about were autonomy, um, giving your students choice. You heard us kind of talk about that a bit before. Um, that that when you give students choice in their learning and how they demonstrate their lear learning, uh, you seem to see a lot more engagement and motivation out of them. Uh, belonging. So he taps into some of the research from um, Maslow and Maslow's hierarchy and moving up the hierarchy, not just making kids feel safe, but also making them feel like they belong in your classroom. Um, developing some competence. So getting into John Hattie's work. Um, and then purpose, fun, and curiosity. When we can leverage all those things together, um, we, it's really a good recipe for getting students motivated in their learning. Um, and what I liked about this article too is that they give some good quick examples of ways to do those, those six pillars there and um, suggestions for how to get started if you're just beginning on it. Yeah, and those six those six bullet points in that article are things that we have 
touched on, I know, all through this podcast, you know, so they definitely do speak to engagement. Um, the article that I chose was Zaretta Hammond's article on equity and engagement. Um, given the focus, I told you that is kind of my big platter right now. It made sense that this article really spoke to me. Um, <clears throat> what I really liked about this article is that she seamlessly connects equity and engagement. They're not separate. They're, they are really inseparable. And um, she also distinguishes between engagement and compliance. And I think that's something that we do in the Ignite Engagement program as well. Um, I think traditionally we have, you know, administrators walk through a classroom and they, they do a visual observation and they see that kids have their hands up or kids are working on the assignment or, you know, talking to each other and they think these kids are engaged. But often the kids are just being compliant and participating, but really don't care about the work that they're doing. And if they don't care about it, they're not going to retain it. And it's just not meaningful to them. So I appreciate that Zaretta Hammond distinguishes in her article between engagement and compliance. Um, she emphasizes the importance of community of learners that we have talked about um, and that's mentioned in the article that Keith just uh, recommended. And, um, and tapping into the funds of knowledge that students already have and moving away from this idea of learning loss that we talked about at the beginning of the podcast. Well, thanks for joining us on our working title podcast. We sure hope to have, we're getting closer to a title. So we're hoping to have a title by our next episode. Uh, we hope you enjoyed uh, this episode. For more information from the episode, including links to the articles we discussed, check out our show notes. Special thanks to Diane Teich for being with us today. Uh, we just truly value all of your expertise around student engagement. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Kelly. It's really been a pleasure to be here with you and Keith today and explore more about what we can do in our classrooms to increase student engagement. Up next, we'll be discussing the February publication of the EL Magazine titled Equity Every Day. So maybe, Diane, you'll need to come back. <laughs> um, we'd love to hear what you think about this podcast. Please rate and review us wherever you're listening. We'll see you next time on Working Title. This podcast is produced by Kelly Brockway and Keith Tramper as a service of Kent ISD. You can contact us and learn more about our team at kentisd.org. We are ASCD members, but we are in no way associated with ASCD or the EL Magazine. Our theme music is Make It Work by All Good Folks. Who knew talking could feel so awkward? Uh, <laughs> and it's not for me. I can talk to a brick wall, but the minute you tell me you're recording me, I'm a hot mess. Welcome to the uh, see already. I see I I can feel my heart rate rise. <laughs> <laughs>